Good afternoon. Good, good just slightly afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Don Hewitt. I'm the director of the OSU Center for Ethics and Human Values, the uh, unit that uh, runs these conversations about research ethics. We are delighted to uh, be able to sponsor these conversations. Too often, I think, questions about research ethics uh, get um, treated as just matters of uh, compliance with regulations, uh, which really cheapens the discussion rather dramatically. And one of the things we hope to do with these conversations is to explore the underlying values that uh, give rise to the regulations and, and, and to look at them um, more deeply in a, in a more interesting way. Uh, <clears throat> Part of the mission of the Center for Ethics and Human Values is to, is to deepen the discussion in this way. And so we were delighted when the Office of Research, and I want to especially point out uh, Jan Weisenberger in the Office of Research, uh, came to us and asked us to organize a series of conversations on uh, research ethics that would be uh, faculty organized and, and led uh, in order to address the real concerns that faculty have about these matters. Um, <clears throat> We hope that one product of these conversations will be uh, concrete proposals about institutional changes that can be made in order to improve uh, research ethics, uh, in order to uh, uh, create the proper inducements for uh, uh, good ethical research. We had a terrific care panel last uh, month looking at the issue of conflicts of interest. Um, next month, we'll be looking at ethical issues that arise doing research in uh, human crises. And this will be in connection with the Post-Research Ethics Analysis International Conference on Ethics and Humanitarian Research. So take a look at the uh, OSU, I'm sorry, the CEHV website at cehv.osu.edu for the events and you can also sign up for uh, notices about the CARE program. So I've already mentioned that, uh, that uh, Senior Associate Vice President Jan Weisenberg was instrumental in in getting the funding for these uh, events, and we're thankful to her and to the Office of Research for that. I want to also acknowledge the work of my uh, colleagues, Pam Salisbury, who is the Associate Dean for Community Outreach and Engagement of the College of Public Health, and Dana Howard, who's from the Division of Bioethics uh, in the Department of uh, Biomedical Education and Anatomy, uh, and the uh, OSU Center for Bioethics, and, and its director, Ryan Nash, has also been helpful in facilitating these discussions. Anyone who's organized an event like this knows it doesn't happen without, uh, without people doing all of the uh, logistics work. And so I need to thank those who have done that. Lavender McKittrick Schweitzer is sitting here. And next to Lavender is uh, Ali Massoff. And Steve Brown, the associate director of the center, and the AV technician, and about a dozen other things uh, for the center. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dana Howard, who will moderate today's discussion. Um, I, I've already mentioned she's from the Division of Bioethics in the Department of Biomedical Education and Anatomy. She's affiliated with the Philosophy Department, and before joining OSU in these capacities, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Bioethics at the National Institute of Health. Dana's work focuses on ethical issues that surround decision making, medical decision making, especially decisions made on behalf of those who can't decide for themselves. And Dana will introduce our panelists. Thanks, Dana. Thank you so much for coming to our second CARE event. Um, so um, according to one recent Nature survey, more than 70% of researchers have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. And so some have sort of, so I, I'm really excited about this uh, panel because one of, I think, the foundational questions is whether some call it a crisis of research uh, rep or a crisis of repl replicability. Others don't think it's a crisis, but it's just sort of the process of conducting research and it's part of the self-correcting role of the scientific method. And so one of the interesting things about um, that we should be thinking about when it comes to the ethical challenges is to do some ground clearing and think a little bit about whether or not this is a crisis. And if it is a crisis, what should we do about it? Who are the agents that are responsible for making sure that um, there are uh, there's surveillance or uh, mechanisms in place to self-correct? And also, a lot of questions have been around sort of the fundamental trust 
um, in the public when it comes to scientific research. Uh, this is coming, the, the potential crisis is coming at a time when the public is already sort of losing trust in science. And so one of the questions to think about is what are the ethical challenges that are related to this um, challenge of replication? Um, so the fundamental trust and also potential um, challenges in uh, the recruiting of participants, especially when it comes to human subjects. So I am really excited about um, this panel. We have uh, a really exciting set of panelists. Um, we have Christopher Chartier, who is an associate professor, or actually uh, associate professor, right? Or mm -hmm. yeah, so associate professor of psychology at Ashland University. He's also the director of the Sci Psychological Science Accelerator, which is a globally distributed network of psychological science laboratories. Um, so there are currently over 350 uh, labs representing 45 different countries um, in different, six different continents. And they can coordinate data collection um, for democratically selected replication of certain key studies. Um, so he's going to be presenting first. And then we're going to have uh, Dr. Philip Popovich, who's a professor and chair um, in the Department of Neuroscience and the co-director of the Neuroscience Research Institute, who's going to be responding, along with Dr. Dwayne Weniger, who's a professor of social psychology and decision theory. And the way it's going to work is um, we're going to have sort of a very quick 20-minute presentation from Chris. And then I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to rebut um, or to just offer your own thoughts on the problem. And then um, we have a set of questions that we sort of developed um, in advance to structure the conversation for about half an hour. But we also want to hear from you about your ethical questions, the challenges that you've experienced as researchers in the field, um, worries that you may have. So what we ask from you is um, if you have one of these sheets that sort of is discussing. At the bottom, there is a go.osu.edu slash ask. If you have any, any questions throughout the um, discussion, please uh, go there, type up your questions, and we're going to have a really like 30 minutes time to actually um, ask your questions and make sure that the discussion is relevant to your interests and worries. All right. To no further ado, um, we would like to have Chris Chartier come up. Yeah, you guys want to see my slides, right? I mean, they're so pretty. I put all this work into them, so. Yep. Thank you. Hey, I'm, I'm Chris Chartier. Um, I'm up the road at Ashland University. Um, if you don't know that spot, it's the Cheese Barn, Grandpa's Cheese Barn. It's that exit. So that's us. That's our other big claim to fame. Um, so as was suggested, I'm going to try to kick us off with a relatively brief set of prepared remarks, just kind of setting the context for issues of reproducibility um, in science generally. I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways I try to address issues of replicability and reproducibility, and I'm really excited to hear what um, the panelists and other folks have um, to say about all of this. Um, so yeah, one of the um, kind of starting concepts I want to introduce um, is actually the motto of the Royal Society. So upon their founding in 1660, they kind of set forth as their motto, uh, nullius in verba. This is the idea that you take nobody's word for it. So it's kind of a fundamental principle of science that we should be able to inspect the data upon which claims are based. We should be able to look at experimental methods and assess them independently. And ideally, we should be able to in independently reproduce or replicate scientific findings if we're going to place any trust in them or kind of hold them up as um, solid claims. And so the talk today will we'll get into maybe some of the ways we've strayed from that and some of the ways we can get back to that kind of founding um, principle or founding idea of the scientific endeavor. Um, okay, for psychologists, of which I am one, we have to start in the year 2011. So we'll go 1660 to 2011. That'll, we'll just skip over the rest of the history of science for the time being. Um, and Daryl Bem published this kind of controversial finding 
um, in JPSP suggesting essentially that we could predict the future. And so it was very controversial um, because we can kind of reject that as defying the laws of nature as we understand them. So in some ways it's just kind of a, a silly incident, I might say, that kind of kicked off this whole discussion in psychology. And you have journalists claiming science is broken. Oh my gosh, the sky is falling. This leads to some of this, I think, conversation about crisis. Um, I prefer Christy Eschwanden's framing. Science isn't broken, it's just really tough and it's gonna be extremely messy. You're gonna have initial claims that have mixed evidence when we try to replicate them. I think that's normal and appropriate. Okay, but that kind of sets the stage um, for some of these conversations. These aren't just kind of like one-off silly incidents, however. There, there is some evidence that maybe there's a deeper problem in my field, and then we'll broaden this out to science more generally. Another example I often use is that of um, this area of research known as ego depletion. It's this idea that exercising kind of cognitive conscious control or willpower um, depletes a finite resource. So if you put fresh baked cookies in front of hungry people and say, whatever you do, you can't eat them. Okay, don't eat the cookies, which looks rather difficult here. And then you give them cognitively challenging tasks, such as use three keys on a pad to say which of the located numbers is different than the others. So you're kind of monitoring and tracking and trying to press where the, the off number is, and I've bolded it there, that the initial depleting task can uh, harm your performance on the subsequent task. This is a pretty seemingly well-established finding in the literature across many operationalizations. Um, this meta-analysis looked at 83 papers, 198 experiments, and found a medium-sized effect across all different ways to try to get at this. And yet, when a huge team tried to look at critically just one operationalization with 2,000 participants, they found nothing, okay? And that can be either really troubling, it could lead you to think there's a crisis, or it could suggest maybe that wasn't the right operationalization and we need to more deeply understand the theoretical underpinnings. Um, broader analyses of reproducibility in psychological science to begin with um, have kind of suggested that this also is an overall issue or something we should face up to. So I was part of a team that attempted to replicate 100 um, published findings in some of our, our stronger journals in psychological science. And what we have here on the figure is going to be the replication effect size and the original effect size. If everything was replicating perfectly, we would see all these dots right along the line here. Obviously, we don't see that. We see a, a fair number of failed replications, and on average, we see about half the effect size in replication attempts compared to original published findings. So again, a mixed bag. We see some things standing up perfectly to replication attempts, other things not so much. Causes us to dig deeper. Um, many have said, well, if this is just psychology's problem, that's cute. You're off doing your little uh, mind tricks. Who cares? But of course, we want to um, be part of the larger scientific discourse. We should also point out that um, in other fields, there are ev there's evidence of some issues of reproducibility or replication um, problems. So we'll look at cancer biology. I think it's a domain people just naturally uh, initially can and intuitively see the importance there, of course, for human lives. Um, scientists at Bayer in 2011 attempted to reproduce or replicate 47 what they thought were exciting cancer biology findings that they wanted to build upon, and they succeeded on less than 25% of those. That, of course, is troubling to scientists and the public. Amgen tried to do something really similar a year later. Um, they released their findings. They tried to build on 53 landmark findings, and they succeeded on less than 15%. So here we see it's not just psychology. These are in scientific domains that I think we should and do care a lot about, and we want to increase reproducibility in those domains. That's usually the moment people say, okay, maybe I care now, um, right? I mean, this impacts friends, family members, loved ones, of course. Um, and then Dana actually referenced um, that nature survey. So another way we could look at this is do scientists themselves say there's a crisis? And the answer there was very clearly yes, 70%. So just to fit that in. Okay, to understand what might be going on, um, a lot of psychologists, we've had about a decade of soul searching, I would say, and trying to figure out is there a crisis? If so, what are the roots of the crisis? This is the, uh, I don't know, fifth grade version of science, the hypothetical deductive model of science, like the science fair grade school model. Um, 
many of us, myself included, did a great job during our careers of deviating from this hypothetical deductive model. And so let's look at some of the problems or some of the mistakes some of us have at times made. Um, we may have relatively vague theories that don't make very pre precise predictions and are therefore difficult to test. Like ego depletion, was that one operationalization, the seminal one, the most important one? We often run relatively underpowered or small studies. We also draw almost exclusively or largely from what we call weird samples, so Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, I got it. Um, for me, that's a bunch of white kids in Northeast Ohio. Like, those are my participants, by and large, right? Um, to what extent do they represent humanity? Who knows? Well, we know somewhat, but. Um, okay, and then we perhaps don't document the full life cycle of our research products adequately, so others may ha really struggle to reproduce them. We then get the data in, and we might engage in all sorts of statistical tomfoolery known as p-hacking, where we're essentially following a garden of forking paths looking for statistical significance. That, of course, can lead to false one, or a false positive type one errors. This is a great term um, Norb Kerr coined. We often hypothesize after the results are known, we hearken back um, and say, aha, I predicted this, I knew it all along. Um, of course, a lot of this, the reason we do it is because we as scientists know that to get published, to get a job, to get promoted, to get tenure, to get grants, we need to publish significant um, findings, significant effects. I just got tenure two weeks ago by publishing a bunch of nulls, but I think I'm the exception, uh, not the rule. I made, yeah, I can't find anything. Let's give this guy tenure. Uh, that's maybe a problem in its own right, I suppose. Uh, okay, so let me just zoom in on a few of these before I talk about some of the, the possible solutions to this. Okay, publication bias, where does this come from? John Oliver has this great uh, clip. No journal wants to publish nothing up with acai berries. We tried to see if there were health benefits. Eh, nothing. Like that doesn't get splashed across Science Magazine, right? So we're trying to publish significant findings. Then we go and we run a series of low-powered or underpowered studies. Um, so this is really striking. Psychologists have in the past collected relatively small samples, just dozens of uh, participants per condition or cell. Um, what can you reliably detect in a really small study? Men are taller than women. Don't need to collect much data. People above median age are closer to retirement by self-report. Women own more shoes than men. Okay, you can reliably detect those differences in small samples. What can't you reliably detect? Spicy food fans like Indian food. You need a fair number of uh, participants for that. Liberals care more about social equality than conservatives. Men weigh more than women. There's enough variance on that. You need a decent sample. People who like eggs eat more egg salad. Smokers think smoking will kill them, they're less likely to think it will kill them than non-smokers. You need a pretty big sample to get that. So the point is, we need to run larger studies, probably, by and large. And we've been doing that over the last decade. <clears throat> okay, how does p-hacking work? Um, researchers gather their data and then engage in a collection of what we might call questionable research practices, collect a bunch of DVs but only report one or two of them. Uh, run six conditions but only report the two that are statistically different from each other and pretend that was kind of like the study all along. Oh boy, round your p-value down. Uh, hmm, 0.052, that looks like 0.05 to me, uh, right? That would be rounding there. And so we see that there's variance in terms of uh, psychologists saying that they've done these things, um, but any of those in isolation is troubling and in combination can be really troubling. And then one of my personal favorites is harking as I suggested earlier, and I just love this cartoon. Psychologists, for a while, we were looking just like ace um, archers, right? So we just pulled back the uh, arrow, let it fly, and lo and behold, boom, 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 boom. Always on target, publishing just significant results. Um, yeah, that's probably unfair to me and others, but anyways, I like the, the cartoon. Sometimes the elephant in the room that doesn't get discussed very much is outright fraud. It's hard to tell how prevalent that is, but we have some examples. So Mike LaCour um, faked the data for a large political science study on changing attitudes by canvassing about issues like gay marriage. Brian Wansink um, has been found to have troubling levels of um, inconsistencies in his published data in food science. Um, Yoshiki Sasai 
has um, been found to kind of uh, fraudulently create data sets out of whole cloth. Um, he later actually committed suicide after some of the embroilment that he got mixed up in. And Diedrich Stoppel from my own home field just made up whole studies and published them and now is an extremely successful author. Uh, this book is called Derailed. It's about how his science career was derailed and it has sold great, of course, because people are interested. Okay, so what seems to be going on here, or we might say that perhaps a results-driven culture in science, this is what Brian Nosek would call it, has led to distorted or perverse incentives. So what we want out of science is careful, rigorous, high-quality research. What scientists might want out of science is to collect a lot of publishable results. I should say this cuts both ways for original studies and replications. We don't want replicators out there finding flashy publishable results. We want their work to be slow and careful as well. If we don't have these two things aligning, what might we get? And I think this will get us to some of the ethical considerations we'll discuss. Um, it'll erode public trust in our science. We might waste our participants' time and effort to the point where they don't want to participate. Researchers may be chasing false leads. They may spend their whole career chasing a published finding that really was spurious or it's a phantom. Um, oh, we can arm the enemies of science. Why should we believe in climate science if psychologists are over here fiddling around with their statistics? Um, is science in general implicated in that? And funding bodies are looking for ways to cut back because that's the directive they're getting from the federal government. Um, are they going to pick out irreproducible fields of science and lessen the funding at a time where we could argue we need more funding to do more careful, rigorous work? Those are the problems of both irreproducible irre 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 research. Those are also problems, perhaps, of playing up too strongly the language of crisis. So there's also an ethical dilemma there, I would say. Okay, quickly I'll run through some solutions and some of the work I've done on this. One thing that um, a lot have called for are signals for folks who are engaging in what we would call open science practices. So folks who are getting closer back to that original idea of nullius in verba. So the Center for Open Science, Brian Nosek's group has done a lot of this work. I've collaborated on it quite, quite a bit of it. People should share their data openly to the extent that that's ethical and privacy concerns are not being ignored so that others can investigate it. They should share all their materials so that others can see how um, the sausage is being made, as it were. They should pre-register their hypotheses so that they can't hark, and we should be conducting more consistent and rigorous replication. So there's like a package, and if you let people put little stickers on their papers, these little badges, people seem to love gathering up these stickers. So they're more likely to open up their data if the journal will put that little stamp of approval right on there. So it's like the elementary school reward that you can give to scientists, I would say. We could be more, I guess, heavy-handed or stronger in how we do this. We could enhance um, some of the enforcement around registration policies. This gets more into the medical sciences. So uh, a big investigation of NHLBI studies found that after clinicaltrials.gov registration was required of these large cl clinical trials, null findings became much more common, right? suggest that perhaps some of these significant findings might not have been significant if they came after this line. It's correlational, but it's, it's suggestive. More troublingly, about a decade after that, um, a group of researchers found that registrations on clinicaltrials.gov were relatively likely to have their primary outcomes switched. For folks to say, here's what we're investigating, then the paper comes out, oh, look what we found over here. Forget about that thing we committed to, okay? So perhaps we need to increase enforcement of those policies. I would also argue that incentives are a big part of this and we can tweak the peer review process. Traditional peer review occurs right here. You do your whole study, and then you go try to get it published. Registered reports is a model where we slide peer review earlier in the process so that we can reward scientists for coming up with a good plan and a rigorous design and then commit to them that their findings will be published regardless of outcome. I think this is particularly important for replication efforts because you can invite original authors in to be peer reviewers early in the process and identify failures of the replication plan. So I just think it's like a killer app for reproducibility. 
So the work that I do was inspired um, largely by the recent uh, solar eclipse. I was brought to tears listening to a radio show about our ability to predict so precisely when these events occur. And it's a type of prediction precision that I think is lacking in a lot of psychological science. Um, so I drove straight home, still wiping tears from my eyes, and threw out a big idea um, while I was swept up in emotion. I said, we should build a CERN for psychological science, put up the blog post, put up a Google form sign up before I could think better of it, um, and suddenly hundreds of researchers have signed up. So some of the key features, it's a decentralized lab network. So we've got labs all over. A CERN for psych won't be a centralized facility. We need to go where the participants are. We accept submissions from anyone, not just our little cadre of buddies in our research group. And then we have a democratic study selection and evaluation process to see what people think is most interesting, replication or novel. And of course, we use hashtag open science practices, trademarks. We do all the open science all the time. So I threw this idea out there coming up on a couple of years ago. And what it's grown into now is the network called the Psychological Science Accelerator. Here are all the little dots for the sites that are members of the network. We have a huge team of researchers and labs with quite a bit of geographic diversity. And what that means is our response to the crisis or opportunity, depending on how you want to put it, is we can run high-powered studies with diverse samples. And we publish on a registered reports model. So we publish our findings regardless of how they turn out. Just to give you um, a little look at how this works, we have a four-stage process. Later, if people are interested in these stages, they can get a hold of me. But every stage here has a team of experts that handle the thing they're most expert at. So this is close to moving towards like a phys physics model. We have translation experts. They work on translation. We have data analysis experts. They work on analysis. Um, and the idea is that we can collate the expertise of a large team of researchers to create more reproducible findings. Our first study is an investigation of a face perception finding. I know you guys aren't, mostly aren't psychologists, so I'll go quickly through this. But the idea is that when we look at and perceive faces, that there are kind of two um, overarching traits that drive all of our other judgments. And they're valence and dominance, essentially. And so attraction, you can predict that from valence and dominance. Trustworthiness, you can prevent, uh, predict that mostly from valence. And so what we're doing. Um, is we're doing a large-scale attempt to see if a high-profile original 2008 finding out of Princeton by Alex Todorov um, applies or generalizes across world regions. So this will come out in Nature Human Behavior when it's all done. That's the point. We're collecting the data. And it will include 164 labs with analyses in all um, World Health Organization regions. So you can see how we're trying to face up to the reproducibility challenges of replication crisis right there in how we're designing these studies. Oh, and Alex Todorov was one of the reviewers. He signed it, so we know. Um, and I think that's just like an amazing element of all of this. Then you go out there and you got to translate things into 24 languages. Here's what it looks like in English. OK, rate that face on trustworthiness. We've got a lab in Tehran, so here's what it looks like in Farsi. And all data collection labs record demonstration videos of the procedures in their lab. So we can have some kind of quality control or some check, which I think has been lacking in some of the larger replication efforts to date. So that's the psychological science accelerator. And I hope you can see how, for me, that kind of comes out of this idea that we want to build these more precise and these more reproducible predictions um, out of our science. I think that that will help fight some of those risks that I had on the side of the slide earlier about eroding trust in science and kind of arming the enemies of science. Um, yeah, I, I should close there. I may later give some comments on um, a large DARPA reproducibility project that I'm kind of working on. But I think it's probably more natural if we let some other panelists get in on the conversation. And then we might bring that up later on. So thank you. Thank you. So why don't we have um, Dr. Philip Popovich uh, pre present next or respond, and then afterwards take five minutes, and then afterwards we'll have um, uh, Dr. Wegner also respond. 
So I'll, I'll just start with a response. I thought that the things that Chris covered in his presentation are um, not just applicable to psychology research, they're certainly applicable to all biological sciences. I mean, you use cancer as an example. I'm a neuroscientist, so we, we talk about the same problems in neuroscience-based research. Um, so you did a really nice job of, of, of covering all the main um, difficulties that we're, that we're faced with in doing re replication. Um, one question, I actually would just go in, into a question then for Chris. Uh, when you presented the, the psychology CERN model, which I think is fantastic, um, I have a hard time understanding how that could ever work in my field, for example, but I'm curious how you've dealt with challenges of credit, because um, you talked about the importance of promotion, tenure, career building across a hundred and some labs. How do you deal with the credit issue? How do you deal with um, credit, not just for the faculty, but also graduate students and trainees with individual laboratories? Because I would guess this becomes somewhat problematic and maybe a nightmare. Yes. <laughs> That's a precise prediction. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just briefly talk about crediting. So we're trying to move to a model of what I'd call contributorship instead of authorship. So we have these crazy long physics style author lists. So um, in physics, when they discovered the gravitational um, waves, direct evidence, uh, which was amazing. That also made me cry. Um, <laughs> there were something like 10% of all physicists were on that paper. Their model. <laughs> And that's what it took to, to show this evidence for one of Einstein's key predictions, which is kind of amazing. That model works because a lot of those folks are paid technical staff. Um, and so they have financial incentives to do the critical work. So one answer is that that's a model we hope to move towards. So translation, data management, ethics management, we'd eventually like to secure funding to, to pay full-time technical staff to do some of that. We currently use a traditional uh, scholarly publishing model, though, for authorship. What that means is we have kind of two key types of people who contribute and find that the incentives are positive for them. People really leading the project, so proposing authors, me, I get to be like Chris, senior author at the end of all these things. And then a lot of institutions were simply contributing to important research and getting even just a line on the CV, even if it is 87th author, that that's productive and worthwhile for them in their promotion and tenure procedures. So these tend to be smaller institutions um, not as research focused. And so the, the key piece we're missing, and I think understandably, are your OSUs, your big research focused institutions where the incentives currently don't align um, for folks to just join purely the massive projects. So I guess my answer is we're trying to improve the incentive structure while also just understanding people have to operate within the systems they currently live in and not expecting folks to put forth effort that's not incentivized. But that's really to the detriment of the project, that we don't have these key leaders in the field at research-focused institutions. Um, I hope I've adequately answered that. Yeah, you, you followed up, I think, very nicely. That was a very appropriate answer. And you, you pointed out OSU being an example of a situation where this probably isn't going to work um, in many, many cases, if not all cases. And I'll just use, again, I'll use myself as an example as a representative from the College of Medicine, where junior faculty will never get promoted and move through the system doing this kind of model, at least under the current guidelines for promotion and tenure process. Senior faculty, like myself, actually participate in things like this in our field. And, but I, I can do that because I've already gone through the process and I'm established, so I don't have to worry about the same things that assistant professors need to deal with, or students. So maybe, I mean, that's something maybe we talk about later, but how do we, how do we change the process to be more inclusive, to create flexibility in promotion and tenure guidelines for people who early on want to get involved in these types of projects? Because I think there's a lot of value in that, and it will only help the, cri the reproducibility crisis if there is one. And I'll just add one question to put on the table is, is it important for all institutions to contribute to this kind of effort? Or is there a potential use or value to having a little bit of a division of labor when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to different aspects of the research? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. 
I guess one reaction I have is that it, it might be quite productive to have folks at research focused institutions on the tenure track mm -hmm. um, pursuing a more traditional model and finding those first new exciting promising findings that can later be followed up on in large scale efforts that might include folks from other institutions. Mm -hmm. I tend to lean towards ideally we'll get everyone involved right. earlier on. Um, but under the current incentive scheme, that seems reasonable and relatively healthy to me. Mm -hmm. right. Well, Dr. Weninger, do you want to chime in? Yeah, and well, you, so you actually have it. It, it relates yeah. a little bit to something I wanted to put up. Um, and so I don't know if you want to transition to that yet or not. Yeah, why don't we, yeah, why don't we have you present here? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I need to go up and do anything or not. I just had a couple real quick slides, but, but um, um, I, actually, I enjoyed the presentation. I think it would be, I mean, we could do this for hours. It would be great to walk through each of the steps that you talked about, not necessarily to disagree with them, but I think to unpack each of them because there's a lot more to a lot of them. Um, thanks. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I think relates to involvement of the, uh, let's just put it as the, the, the basic research experts in a particular area, I think that one way to think about um, the involvement of everyone would be to make sure that those people are involved. Um, and one of the potential costs in these large-scale efforts is a bit of diffusion of responsibility. It's good to see that there are some things to try to combat that. Um, but even at that, you wonder, for, for the things that are chosen, you hope that there are content experts that are, are involved from the very start. Um, and one of the reasons that, that I think that ends up being really important is, at least in some instances in the previous replication work, I'm not sure that's always been true. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to put up a couple slides with one example, um, not because I know that there's any, you know, I don't have any way to know what the representativeness is of uh, any particular um, situation, but, but this is just an example um, where uh, in the Many Labs 3 um, was going through to pick out a number of um, well-known uh, kind of foundational effects in, in social psychology. Um, and one of those happened to be, um, let's see, is this the, uh, I don't know where the, anyway, I, can, I don't know if I have a pointer on here. There we, there we go. Yeah, so, um, so one of them was, uh, I don't want to get into the effect so much, but it was an amount of processing effect that Rich Petty and colleagues had done uh, some years back. Um, and in this effort, they attempted a, a direct replication. There were a number of other studies that have shown that type of effect and none the, in the literature. And nonetheless, um, it was a dismal failure within, within this context with about 2,400 participants, which is huge compared to what the original research was. Um, and so um, when that original work was published, there was uh, the, the original researchers were asked to give commentary. And, and part of the commentary was saying, well, OK, when we go in and look at this, um, neither of the independent variables were the variables as we developed them. There wasn't any pretesting of any of the changes that had been made and what the consequences of those changes might have been. And there was no consideration of moderators that have been discovered since the original research that would have said, if you want to find this effect, you need to look in these kinds of places. Um, and so their conclusion in that uh, was to say that those methodological choices basically rendered that attempt uninformative. Now, um, usually that's where it would stop, right? Um, and if you look at things like you know, the reproducibility project and you have a you know, hundred different things, and you say, well, gee, these were successful, these weren't. And some people would go, oh, yeah, but the way they did it was this. Or, oh, yeah, but they didn't ask us about that or, uh, or whatever. Um, and that's where it would stop. Unfortunately, um, Petty and, and colleagues didn't stop there. Um, they did uh, a replication of that failed replication, but then also redid the work in the ways that they would have wanted to see it done. Right? So to say, OK, um, let's create what we would consider to be optimal methods um, not necessarily identical to the first study. Um, actually, the materials for that 1983 uh, work was no longer available, but they said, if, here are materials that we know work. Um, here are some additional things we've learned since. And when they did that, um, they were able to produce, reproduce the effect. 
and also to reproduce the lack of an effect using the other methods that the, 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 repl uh, the replication had used. Okay? Not only that, and, and, and even if that happened, that would be unusual, but not only that, then the original replicators went back and tested both of those and showed that if you use the new materials and, and such, they get the effect as well. Um, and they also, although it was slightly stronger than they initially found, they also found uh, a lack of significance when they used their uh, materials a second time. Okay. Um, and so, now, is that representative of all replications? I'm sure not, right? Um, but it can happen. And not knowing how representative that is, that that's, makes one wonder, are people going into the, the weeds of how do we understand even what the replication, lack of replications mean? Right? The, the, the asymmetry that we will always have is that there are many reasons that things can fail to occur, and always more reasons why they would fail to occur than there were reasons for something to occur in the first place. Um, and where a lot of, to date at least, where a lot of the replication work has stopped is said, we don't find it. But it hasn't then done what the original researchers had to do. When the original researchers find an effect and someone says, oh, well, you say it's because of this, but I think it might be because of that. So then you do another study to show, oh, no, it really was because of why I said. And it might take three or four of those to make the case strong enough to say, here's the explanation that we think is the strongest explanation. But so far in our literature on lack of replication, people haven't then been asked to go on and say, well, but why is it that it didn't replicate? Was it because this was wrong? Was it because that was wrong? Or was it a fluke? You know, they haven't had to do the additional work that the kind of normal science model would have had for the original effects. And I think that has resulted in us kind of being left with, eh, they didn't find it. And, and there hasn't been much uh, digging into, but why is that? Right? And so I hope that part of the evolution of this is that there is more of the normal science model that's actually taken to the replications to say, OK, let's go in here and understand why this is happening. And it also, I, I think part of that model, I don't want to take any more time now, but I'll be happy to in questions, is it also comes down in part to what are our goals in the original work? How are we intending to use this? And that actually determines whether some of those lack of replications are or are not viewed as problematic in the ways that, that um, you know, some of the, the previous work has shown, right? To say, OK, um, if this drug that everyone takes doesn't, doesn't really work, of course, that, that's bad. I, I don't know of anyone that's going to go in and, and, and use this particular effect and say, ah, we're going to apply that the way this was done to now intervene in amount of processing in, in uh, you know, the uh, negotiations over nuclear uh, you know, test treaty or something. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there are some differences there that I think we also have to address. But anyway, thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to just set up some grounding questions. And people are already um, writing up some questions. So thank you. Remember, go to go.osu.edu slash ask if you have any questions. Um, <clears throat> we're starting to collect those. So um, before, I mean, so one thing that you, uh, you just talked about was sort of not all replication studies are alike. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a way, a metric, um, so are all failures of rec replication going to undermine our trust or, you know, are they all bad? Um, are there some that, uh, should we be aiming at direct replication in general or should we be aiming more of conceptual replication um, and uh, moving forward, uh, what is sort of the goal, I guess, of this sort of process of replication? Yeah. We've got about three days worth of material. Yeah, I know, sorry. That was like three different <laughs> barreled questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I would just say this was great. Um, the Latrell, Petty, and Zoo response here was like a real turning point for me. I'm on some of these papers. And um, it was kind of an eye-opening experience. And what it revealed to me in relation to this question is that our replication efforts need to be deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, so Danny Kahneman was really critical of Many Labs 3. And so when Kahneman says 
uh, things you listen. Um, and one of the things he was critical of is when you try to replicate a bunch of effects in kind of one bundle, none of them get that deep care that you want to see in the peer review process. And I think this is just a great demonstration of, of um, yeah, the corrective nature of science. And so that, that was really kind of promising. So I guess what I would suggest is not all replications are created equal. And I feel like we need to move to a model where we're much more deeply vetting replication procedures and ideally including, the reason I love registered reports so much is because you can include those substantive experts, those leaders in the field, early in the design process, not after you have a failure or a success to replicate. Um, it would have saved a bunch of time here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, heck, Petty's in the audience. We could have just <laughs> asked him, right? In the peer review process, we could have said, what do you think about this before we go and do it? And he would have said, oh, well, here are all these problems I can identify because I'm the one who knows it best. So it would just um, streamline the process. And also without unnecessarily raising alarm bells when they're not warranted. So. I guess I'd, I'd push for like a deeper replication model with more careful peer review earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. I just love registered reports. So anytime I can insert that in an answer, I do. Let me respond to that a little bit. Um, by giving you a, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a brief story that gets at all these points, I think, a little bit. So I was funded by the NIH specifically to work on replication studies in the field of traumatic spinal cord injuries. This was a, uh, nationwide call that was set out as a competitive bid and there were two contracts awarded. There was one awarded here, there was one awarded out in California. And it was awarded based on skilled expertise in modeling and outcomes assessment and preclinical models of spinal cord injury. So we're already getting at a really important criteria within replication in biological sciences is not all replications are equivalent because not every laboratory has the same skill sets mm -hmm. and background to do replications even though they attempt them. Okay, so in this case we were vetted and it was peer reviewed, contracts were awarded to these expert laboratories. Then within the, the, within the guidelines for the, for the contract, we had to vet the scientific literature for target replications. So which studies have been published that garnered a lot of attention in the community, got a lot of media attention, which ones do we choose for replication? And so our advisory boards, we all created advisory boards to vet the, the selections that we put forward. And it was interesting, that was an interesting process because everybody has a slightly different philosophy on what constitutes a, uh, a project that should be attempted to be replicated. Is it because, oh, it's faulty to begin with, so we want to prove that that drug or that intervention should not move forward at all, so we can put double the dose down and say, bad study? Or should we really try to find those studies that reported something that could be really robust and have impact on human health? And so there was a lot of discussion about this. And I have to say that our site did things differently than the site in California in terms of how we vetted those projects for replication. We chose to go after the projects that we thought were really well done projects that if we did the project right, if we did the replication right, it would yield a positive replication. California group didn't really do it that way. They had a slightly, they had a moving target on how they chose theirs, but I mean, they, they did good replications. I'm not, get, I'm not gonna get into that. But when we started our replications, we started with really what we thought were robust effects, things that we would replicate. Now I'm gonna get into the details, this deep dive on replication. So we started off our very first replication study. It was in a high profile journal from a very reputable lab. Um, we had discussions with the PI of the original study to actually design our experiments. Um, we, we thought we had checked all our boxes. Make a long story short, we did the experiment, we came back, couldn't replicate the study. I went back to the investigator and said, here are the data. I shared all the data with him, and he was, he was very surprised. And he and I spent hours talking about why the project could have failed. And to make another long story short, we spent significant time together going back and forth and ultimately figured out um, some of the biological variables that were intrinsic to the model systems that we're using that when we controlled for those, we replicated the data. So that taught us the deep dive on the replication. Not only was it important for the replication, it taught us something about the, the disease process that we were studying. And that's not often done in, in the biological sciences. In fact, 
I can't think of another example in my field in particular, probably in another, even in the cancer literature where that's happened. Mm -hmm. So this is, I'm, I tell you the story as, uh, to show you the complexity in the replication field. It's, it, it's much deeper than even we're talking about right now. And when you're in knee deep in it, um, you really start to learn. In fact, I had uh, one of the, my faculty colleagues, when we had this replication contract um, awarded to us, he said to me, he goes, why would you want to even get involved in this? He goes, it seems like a career killer. You're going to spend all this time working on what's likely to fail, and you're not going to be able to publish. And, and that's, that's true. <laughs> although, we did, although we did publish. We published all the data, negative and positive. Um, it's just, it, the reality is that it's not really something to build a career off of. At least not in my field, it wasn't. I'd like to address the, <clears throat> the question about um, conceptual versus direct replication because that's getting a lot of, of um, traction and um, it depending on how you come at it I mean the, the thing about it is this right so for a lot of what we're discussing in this work um, the notion of direct replication is um, well for one there's no such thing right because you can't go back and use the same participants right so there's just no such thing um, you can try to come as close as you can, and, and that's usually what people mean by direct replication. Um, but here's the thing, at least in psychology, um, we are testing psychological constructs we, and psychological mechanisms. Um, and that's, in, by and large, not all the studies, and this is where we have to get into some other issues, but by and large, for wh what I'm talking about is basic research in, in psychological science. And you're testing... Um, psychological constructs. Um, you're not testing the message that you used, right, or the the um, uh, what the the picture that you the picture is arbitrary. What you use to represent that untrustworthy person, or what, although that's some of that is visual, so you may care about the specifics of it. But by and large, when we're manipulating things, the operationalization that you use is arbitrary. That's not the interest, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and if that's the case, then when you go to do a replication, you better be darn sure that the operations that you choose are appropriate to the participants that you have in that new study. If you don't, you're not even testing the same hypothesis because you're not creating the same psychological states. And so, for people that treat the direct replication thing as if it were a recipe mm -hmm. that says use the same materials, it's not a very thoughtful way of considering what the purpose of the original research even was. And in some cases, it may be absolutely appropriate and right to start with the materials that were there in the original study, because that will probably come closer than just something I make up out of my head. Um, but in many, many cases, those materials were designed and pre-tested for the context they were dealing with. Easy example, if I'm doing an in-group, out-group study here at Ohio State, it's a no-brainer. <coughs> Ohio State, Michigan. That's easy, <laughs> right? But I can't just go use those materials in California or in Asia. It doesn't mean anything to them. And that's obvious. But even when it's not obvious, this, the same principle still applies. If you want to study groupiness and belonging and those kinds of things, come up with groups that are meaningful for the context that you're dealing with. Right? So actually, I think the term that Rich used in a recent paper was a direct conceptual replication. Right? So you, you're using, the, the purpose is direct. The purpose may be to replicate and not necessarily to extend in a particular direction to say, does it happen with these adjustments? But you're still creating the materials in a way and pretesting them in a way that works with the original purposes of the research, right? Now, if you're studying aspirin or if you're studying you know, some, something where you say, this is the same treatment for every person that we give it to, right? Then you might be much more concerned about the operationalization that you specified. Because you think that that's going to be the same for everyone, or at least you want it to be, right? That's not what we're doing in basic psychological research. It's just not. So 
you know, if you, if you take the operations that a person developed and then take them somewhere else and they don't work, that, that would be like criticizing a chemist because their reaction that they studied in the lab with H2O didn't work when you did it in the Olentangy, <laughs> right? That's what it would be like. But you'd say, that's crazy. Why would you do that, right? Um, so, so why would we do that here? We have to be more thoughtful about, well, what is it that we're actually saying? Are you even testing the, the same mechanisms, the same states that they created in the original research? If we don't pay attention to that, then all of this is, is taking a lot of risk. I mean, people saying, oh, it just doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's all fake, uh, whatever, um, for, for very little gain. So I'm going to stop the structured, and there was one question from the audience that I think is really useful, and it seems like this idea of direct conceptual replication has brought it up. I'm just going to invite all of you to um, define what you think replication is and what a successful, like what, what would a successful replication study look like um, in, in abstract terms. <laughs> but, well, I think you just defined it, Duane, what, what a replication is. It's a relative attempt, I think, at trying to reproduce a, uh, a robust observation, and that robustness is, is a critical component of it. You, mean it you're, you may not be able to replicate everything exactly. You know, for in, in my field, as an example, if we're looking at the effect of a drug on a specific outcome measure, we want that outcome measure to be something that multiple laboratories can, re, um, to, can carry out reproducibly and reliably, and we want the effect of our drug to be above a certain threshold. Um, so if you're going to try to replicate, you want to see a similar change in between your treatment and your control group, and you want it to be consistently robust across most of the laboratories. Is it going to be identical? No. Highly unlikely. Is it going to be the same drug? Sometimes no. So you want to make sure that it's a robust effect. If it's not, then the question lies in everything we've been talking about. Where did the failure occur? It wasn't necessarily because the drug was a bad drug or the design of the experiment was poor. It could be that the drug wasn't from the specific vendor, wasn't created the same. And the only way you know that is if you compare it. And that actually happened in one of our replication studies. Same drug, same molecular structure, but it was created differently. Um, we only found that out after the fact. But there's no way to control for that ahead of time. Um, until you're getting into clinical trials when you have to actually control for that, but not in a preclinical setting. So I think that defining replication really is looking at robustness of effect across multiple sites and having consistent phenomena. It doesn't have to be absolute. I think, again, you have to have, rely on robust statistics, robust statistical modeling, um, making sure your group sizes are just, I mean, everything that Chris pointed out in his presentation goes into defining what replication means. So I try to reserve the term replication for situations when you do expect the same operationalizations to lead to the same pattern of effects in a relatively similar sample. So I use it really kind of tight. And I like this, uh, what was it, direct conceptual? That's lovely. Um, <laughs> sometimes I, I think of those sorts of things. I, I use the term a robustness test or a generalizability test. And so for me, replication is a really close circle. When you do expect the operationalizations to um, lead to the same psychological constructs and therefore the same outcomes, and I tend to use terms like generalizability for something else. And that's a situation where you, you think that you may need to change your methodological operationalizations or change your sample to get new insights. That all is derived from theory, so that's much more difficult. Um, the more I do this work, the less I use the word replication, um, which I don't know if that's a healthy process or if I should find ways to salvage the term, but it, it's strain, the definition is strained as you get more and more into the process of actually doing this work. So we tend to use terms like generalizability or robustness tests a little bit more. I, I do think it's good, though, when you have no a priori reason to think that the operationalization should work differently in this sample, apply the term replication, we can put our marker down and make a prediction and let the chips fall where they may. So I think that's it's a pretty small uh, space, though, in my opinion, where the term is most appropriate. I, one thing I would 
expand on just a little bit is the use of the term successful or failed. Um, and I think that that's something that, um, that now I think people are being a little more thoughtful about it, at least I hope they are. But traditionally, it was really, um, it was really tied to statistical significance and saying, OK, well, if we failed to find a significant effect here, whereas people have before, then that's a failure. Um, but the problem with that is that meta-analytically, or if you look at, at evaluating the data as a whole, in many cases, what was added would actually strengthen the evidence for that effect as opposed to detracting from it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's much easier to define a failure of replication as when these added data would weaken the case for this effect. That is a clear failure. Right? But when the added data would actually strengthen the case, even though the added data may not on their own be significant, I don't think you can call that a failure. You might be reticent to call it a complete success, but on some level, I think it is, if it's strengthening the evidence overall, then I would treat that more to the side of it is supportive of the initial effect and so more of a successful attempt. Yeah, a concrete example there. If you go conduct the same operationalizations in 100 labs with 20 observations, likely none of them will reveal independently a significant effect. But meta-analytically, yeah. you may have a really strong package of evidence. So sure. I agree sure. completely with that. So there's a lot of questions that I want to get to from the audience. But before we do that, I just want to um, foreground the ethical challenges. And so, I mean, there's, um, so, I mean, one of the main ethical challenges is just sort of about the wide scale failure and how it potentially undermines public trust in research and funding and all those things that happen. Um, but more recently, there's also been at least bioethicists, um, Arthur Kaplan and others, have brought up the worries about um, possible risk benefit um, analysis when it comes to minimizing risks, risks for participation for um, research. And so if we have these sorts of wide-scale problems with replication, should we be worried about um, figuring out how to minimize possible risks for participation in research? And this moves a little bit from only thinking about social psychology and moves towards thinking more about biomedical research. And um, so I'm interested to hear I'm interested in that question, but I'm also interested if there are any other ethical challenges that you think really should be on the table for discussion as we think about replicability. You guys want to tackle that, or? <laughs> I mean, I mean we've there's a lot of different answers to that. I mean, I actually didn't really hear a specific question. Are there ethical challenges with failure to reproduce data? Yeah, so is the failure to reproduce data going to be make it more difficult to figure out um, just sort of how risky participation in research is for potential um, sure. participants. Sure, yeah. I think and the answer to that is yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, the answer to that to, is yes, and, and I can think of specific examples of intervention, cell-based therapies, for example, in spinal cord injury that have moved towards clinical trials uh, based off of kind of poor, sketchy preclinical data. So that, but that gets at a totally separate issue, parallel issue, and that's related to how do we evaluate the robustness of an experiment that then goes forward to a clinical trial. And there is no essential component right now for a, an intervention to be replicated before it moves into clinical trial. And so that get, there's financial reasons, there's political reasons that things move forward to clinical trials. There's patient need and patient advocacy that helps push some of that as well. Um, but I would love there to be a replication a step in the middle that made things increase the robustness, prove the robustness of an effect before it went to humans. But that doesn't currently exist, at least not in, in, in the biomedical research area. And so there, there's a ver See, this is where some of the differences in fields, I think, end up being interesting insofar as, um, you know, one of the points that, that um, was mentioned earlier and that is often mentioned is a perception that there's relatively little replication that's been going on through the years. Mm -hmm. And yet, in, in most of our top psychological journals, you couldn't publish the initial paper unless you had multiple examples of the effect in that paper. And so there's built-in replication 
in the publication process, because you can't make the case that this is an effect that is, is there in the first place unless you have multiple examples of it. Um, and then there are also other things like construct validity and other things that can be enhanced by conceptual replication, that it's not just tied to this operation and things like that. But the other part of this that gets ignored often when people talk about the, the presumed lack of replication is that you can't really do a meaningful extension of an effect without having replication cells in your design. Mm -hmm. You just can't. And, and yet anything that is an extension is classified as something different, it's not a replication. But it makes no, it, in most cases it makes very little sense to have done an extension that had no replication as a part of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of the premise of some of the, the statements are a little misplaced, at least insofar as they say, well, there aren't a lot of studies that are merely replication, which is, of course, not the way you'd want to put it. But that's, that's kind of the way they end up classifying those statements, because that's all they're counting as replication, is something where the primary goal was mere replication. So can I comment on the participant experience or mindset? I think one of the big issues that this ethical question raises is that we, we kind of have a commitment or a responsibility to our human subjects participants that their data are going to be used in a relatively pure pursuit of truth. Can you imagine being in one of these clinical trials and then finding out that your, the results were suppressed, not published, or that the outcome was switched? Um, so I think that that's, that's a key responsibility that we have to maintain that trust. We all have folks come into our lab. Our, I'm looking at you because I know how like our world works. But we have folks come into our lab um, who probably believe what we're doing is that fifth grade hypothetical model, um, hypothetical deductive model. So for me, that's one of the big ethical problems. Um, we owe it to our participants to publish all of the findings regardless of outcome. And I, I think that's sometimes where we've fallen short. Um, I think they realize that sometimes we'll be looking for discoveries that don't pan out. And I think participants are comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But they're probably not comfortable with suppression of null results or outcome switching. I guess those are just like clearer ethical violations, but something we should work to diminish. All right, so we're going to move on to audience questions. Um, so the first one is pretty straightforward. Um, it could be, a, it's an operational question, but also a potentially ethical question about how it should be done. So with the multi-lab collaboration, there's not only worries about authorship, but also what is this, is there a central location for IRB um, oversight? What is the IRB process? Um, what should the process be, ideally, even if it's not the process right now? Am I the guy to start this one? <laughs> uh, it seems like that's directed to me. Um, so what was your phrase earlier about authorship? It seems like it could be a mess. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll apply that to IRB as well. It's a really, or it's a difficult or sticky challenge. So the model that we're pursuing, and I think um, is most appropriate under the current system, we end up having a, a small team of leaders on the project get IRB approval at their local institutions for the larger global project um, with the whole plan laid out. Uh, procedures, register report, data collection plan all laid out. Um, oftentimes when we have a few of those first dominoes, uh, other institutions can rely upon the IRB approval of the original institution. So maybe we have, ideally here we do use like the prestige institutions, like man it'd be great to show this has been approved at OSU, um, at Stanford, and at Yale, um, where presumably things are relatively stringently reviewed. Um, many IRBs will not rely on another institution's IRB. So that simply doesn't work there. In that case, they submit an independent uh, IRB submission for the whole shoot and match. Um, and that can get really interesting. <laughs> I would also say that IRB regulations, well, by definition, vary hugely uh, across nations. And so we have huge diversity in terms of the ethical review that occurs at our independent sites. From like six months um, horror story IRB review that you sometimes hear, all the way to virtually all human subjects research in our world being exempt. Mm -hmm. um, so because of that, we ethically review our projects to make sure they meet this kind of minimum bar. A, a concrete challenge we faced is um, for some of our studies, 
measuring or recording the ethnicity of participants might be really interesting and important. So for the face processing study, and you have um, places like France where that's pretty much a no-go unless you have a really compelling reason to measure ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So in the aftermath of the Holocaust, um, regulations got a lot tighter around measuring um, ethnicity in France, essentially. Mm -hmm. So we face these challenges. Mm -hmm. Do we change the entire project? The way we've answered that so far is no. We simply don't measure those, those data, those mm -hmm. measures in the locations where it's not approved. But man, it's a big source of the work. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where the question was kind of motivated from. Um, but again, that's us operating in the current system we have. We end up going out, oh, this is going to be a treasure trove for meta scientists. Send out the same IRB to 150 uh, IRBs, see what comes back. The diversity is huge. So there's some interesting questions to answer there, I think, as well, even within the US. But that's what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. No, so um, what are the most effective changes that can be made at the institutional level to address the challenges of replication? So at OSU, what can be done? There's a lot. That's a long, that's a whole discussion too. Um, <laughs> let's just start with one. I mean, one of the things for publication is for, for faculty to be promoted from assistant to associate and associate to full, publication is key. Um, publication and funding. Uh, publications are here at OSU, at least in the College of Medicine, it's, there are specific numbers of papers that must be published to make rank, and there are specific quality metrics that need to be um, met to, be, to make rank. And they say one is not more important than the other, both are very important. So there's, these are very difficult things to, um, to evaluate. Um, I would argue personally that the quality of the science should dictate whether someone moves forward in rank, but how do you evaluate the quality of science? Do you rely on the journals that they publish in? That's what most people do. That's what most institutions do. They rely on that, the damnable impact factor. Um, the impact factor of a journal dictating the quality of a scientist's work. And if you publish X number of papers in a high impact journal, you are going to be much better off than if you publish twice as many papers in a less uh, high impact journal or a lower impact journal. So one of the things that I would like to see happen in my lifetime as a scientist is nobody to ever talk about the impact factor again <laughs> and, and people to simply evaluate the quality of science is based on the impact it's had in the field. And that can be evaluated in a number of ways. And we do take it into account, but it always seems to be secondary or tertiary to some of these other metrics. You know, are people actually citing the work and using the work to frame and modify their own science? Um, is the, are the observations that are being put forth in these publications bringing in um, other scientists and students to the, to the person's laboratory to work with them? Um, there's many different things. Media, media is a plus and minus. You know, there's some positives to that. There's some negatives to that. But taking these things more as a whole and not relying on numbers and not relying on impact factors, to me, would be really a key, key factor at the institutional level. Because once you start doing that, if you can get better at dealing with um, creating science that's more reproducible because you're not worried about creating least publishable units, or LPUs, as they're referred to. <laughs> and you can focus on a really big problem. I read, it, I think it was in Science or Nature once, somebody put forth an idea that when you get your faculty position as an assistant professor, that you should be given five tickets. OK, those five tickets are the tickets that you cash in for your publications. You only, only really need to do five, but you've got to cash them in before you can go to the next rank. And so you really have to decide, is this the work that I want to publish or not? And, and right now, that, that decision comes into play, but it's also countered by all these other competing forces that I just mentioned. I, I don't know if this is necessarily, uh, I don't know if this is what the person had in mind in terms of an institutional um, action. But one of the things that, um, I despair about just a little bit is that in the field more generally, some of the same incentives that have been discussed here um, 
they, ha they have insidious effects that start when the person walks in the door for graduate school where they feel like I've got to get something published soon and I've got to get something published often. And what we end up failing to do as an institution is creating real experts, creating people that are deep, have deep knowledge that they appreciate how what they're doing is building on what's been done before as opposed to having that pressure of I need to do something brand new and, and I need to do it right now and, you know, yeah, later I'll figure out what everyone else has done, but right now I just have to get something published. No, you need to learn what people have done so that you know what you can contribute and how that builds on what we've done before. And that would, that would solve a lot of things, including in replication domains, having a better appreciation for where does this work fit within everything else? What are all the other related kinds of work? Right, so um, for example, um, when people talk about some of the problems with low power, right, of studies, um, a lot of the analyses that they do with that um, treat it as if you had um, the, the, the numbers that you see that people are saying, oh, you know, half of the work that's out there could be wrong. They make some crazy assumptions, if you ask me, in some of that work. One of them being that you have to assume that there's a 90% chance that the null hypothesis is true in a lot of those analyses. And yet, a big part of what you're supposed to do in an introduction section and in developing your theory is to say, here are all the reasons that this theory should not have 90% chance of, of the null hypothesis being true. Here's a rationale that says, no, there, there's a bunch of other data, not doing exactly what I'm doing, but a bunch of other data that supports that these kinds of principles work, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if, if, you know, if you ignore all of that and, and, you know, then maybe, yeah, maybe you are barking up trees that, you know, that are really the null hypothesis is true. But if you're doing that work and becoming a deep expert, I think that has to help. I'm not going to speak to OSU, but I would just abolish the publication system as it currently exists. <laughs> I just got tenure. I can say things like that. <laughs> uh, I pull up the ladder. No, what I mean by that is I, I like these ideas of moving to a system where we reward true impact on one hand and the development of true expertise on the other. And typically, neither of those things are going to be by churning out papers. I think it's fewer heavier, deeper papers that are, are, should be rewarded. Um, so I would love to just see a preprint only system where we put up our best work, welcome the community to evaluate it, um, and oh, the impact factor. I'm with you, that's a bad <laughs> one. But what, what pops up in its place? Is it purely article level citation metrics? Is that much better? I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's tricky. But um, I do think that the crux of the issue is the current publication model. Um, and there being a list of journals that you must get into to clear the hurdle. Which are, do which are dominated, these journals, dominated by editorial oversight rather than necessarily just scientific oversight. Mm -hmm. and that's the one thing that, that I think that if, unless you're in science publishing in science, journals you don't appreciate you try to go after these, I lost my mic. No. When you're trying to publish in these, these high impact journals and you, know, you go through the peer review process and you have your colleagues provide feedback on the science, then you jump through many, many hoops for many, many years. Go ahead. I'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Only to then come back to have the editors make a unilateral decision. And I've mm -hmm. seen this happen many times where poor science has actually been vetted by the scientists saying this is not worthy of publication to be overturned by an editor because it's edgy, it's, mm -hmm. it's note noteworthy, and it should be published anyway because it will sell journals and it will increase citation rates for specific um, journals. That that does disservice to science, but it happens. It happens often, actually. So how do you see replication and reproducibility happening in studies using secondary data? So for example, electronic health data, especially from countries like Norway, um, are used a lot in public health research. Um, are there distinctive ethical, ethical challenges when it comes to, or pragmatic challenges when it comes to those kinds of studies? 
So ideally, those secondary analyses would be registered beforehand. Um, but that requires a much higher level of trust in time-stamped mm -hmm. registrations um, for folks making those secondary contributions. Um, it's pretty easy to establish when you collected data and to suggest that your hypotheses were pre-registered. It's much more difficult to pre-register secondary contributions. Mm -hmm. One model some um, gatekeepers of the data have kind of put forth is that you, you need to register a hypothesis or at least an analysis plan before gaining access. So the data are essentially open, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a two-stage process. That, I don't know if I'm completely comfortable with that. Some data, that's probably the right call. Um, it's much tougher than data collection. So I would, I would love to see a registration system for those secondary contributions. Um, that just involves usually a higher level of trust mm -hmm. in the researcher. I think usually, though, we trust our colleagues not to outright lie to us. Um, we showed some examples of fraud. I think typically those aren't our biggest problems. Um, and that we do trust fellow scientists to say what they're doing. So I think even a, a simple registration system is, enhances the trust in secondary analyses. Yeah, I think another aspect of that, but not, I mean, it, it's one that runs throughout all kinds of data, and that has to do with, I think in those data sources, you often have uh, even more of a potential distance between what the conceptual variable is and what was actually measured. And people end up making a lot of choices about what can, you know, what measures are close enough to what I want to talk about that I can use them as indicative of this construct that I'm interested in. Um, and you, you hopefully you'd have less of that problem when you're developing the measures yourself, mm -hmm. right? Um, but to be sure, and, and you see this in you know, drug studies and all that kind of thing, there are lots of additional measures that may be taken as possible outcomes that may or may not have been you know, planned initially and right. partly because of the cost of doing the work. And so it's understandable. But that's just an illustration of, you know, there, there are often these times where you have measures and you go, well, okay, well, maybe this didn't really pan out, but what about that? Or what about that? Um, or maybe this measure is kind of close enough, and if we put that with this, then things differ. And so there's, you know, that ends up being less the case, I think, when you have a more focused, theoretically derived study where the theory is driving the measures that you're taking. Um, but when you're doing secondary data analysis, you're always, often looking for what are measures that are close enough. Right. Can I say one more thing on that? Mm -hmm. I think this gets back to the ethical imperative to make maximal use of participants' data. We want those secondary contributions because we're just we're getting more value out of their participation. Um, so I forget the organization, but I love there's this an, there's this award they've started called the Research Parasite Award. And it's kind of like poking fun at this uh, derogatory term for somebody who uses someone else's data. But like, how can we actually incentivize that? Probably don't call it the Research Parasite <laughs> Award. Like, eventually we should move beyond that and say, like, landmark contribution to secondary analyses. Um, yeah, but we should incentivize with awards, um, with publications, the reuse of those data because they're valuable. In many cases, they're difficult to recollect, and, and we owe it to our participants to make maximal use of them. I think. So we should be research parasites uh, when yeah. possible. Yeah. Getting back to the one question that you asked earlier about what institutions should, could do to improve re reproducibility and replications. Um, at the federal level, if, if the government, for example, required you to register your studies, that would change things as well. And the reason it would change things is one thing we haven't really talked about is is the trust issue between colleagues. Even though I, I may trust your data, I'm not necessarily going to tell you what I'm doing because you might steal my idea and go out and do the experiment because you have similar skill sets that I do. And that's actually a pretty important uh, component of, at least in the biomedical research field, maybe it's, maybe it's also true in psychology research, but you know, people don't trust each other very much. And when you're in a highly competitive area where funding is you know, limited, people aren't willing to talk about things until much later in progress, mm -hmm. you know, after the experiments are mostly done. Mm -hmm. So if the NIH made you register, pre-register your ideas, that might change things altogether. Yeah, you go to a conference, present those exciting new data, and then see it published by someone else. <laughs>
That's, yeah. that's the worst case scooping scenario, but registration does seem to solve that. In BioArchive, it's now a journal that, that people are using to, to pre-publish results before they've been submitted to one of these larger high impact journals. And so a lot of people are now using BioArchive to put data out there for peer review and, it, and it's, it's live and it can be updated by the scientists and it can be commented on by the field as the science is ongoing. And, that's, and, it, and it's not precluding you from publishing later in a, um, you know, a high impact journal. In fact, a lot of those journals have made open statements that they'll take um, papers from BioArchive once they've been finalized for publication. So um, we only have four minutes left, and so I'm going to bundle two questions, um, and you could choose how to answer them. Um, so the first is related, actually, to potential high-risk um, studies and the prioritization of replication, um, or studies where, um, for example, um, studies about risks of on, uh, on pregnant women, right? So uh, potentially vulnerable populations. Um, when it is unethical to randomize participants for an exposure level, how should we think about replication of those sorts of studies? Um, are there extra ethical challenges or how should we prioritize um, replication? And then the second question is attempting to replicate findings and testing a hypothesis for the first time are substantively different because replicators already know the previous findings. So it would, uh, would blinding PIs of replication help? Is there a way to counteract at least that very specific difference in terms of the, uh, the attempt at replication? I'll start, with the, I'll start with the first one. My wife's pregnant, so that one really like piqued my interest. And, so with an initial study, you may have a, a situation where the initial finding is the, the very finding that suggests further research is high risk for that population. It may reveal the risk, right, in that initial study. And so, and then it's ethically dubious to recruit participants for a replication of that effect. So my initial reaction to that is it makes the earlier interventions in the research life cycle all the more important for situations where replication is just um, ethically challenging. That's why we want to make that initial study more strongly registered and designed up front. Um, my wife and I were not going to sign her up for a replication project of a risky <laughs> intervention, right? Like, and here I am, Mr. Replication Guy. Like, not going to happen. Um, and so I think I heard that one, I thought, man, that makes the case for those stronger research interventions earlier on in the process to avoid some of those ethical challenges. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say on that one. I can talk more about the, the blinding question. I think it, it's not, I don't, I can't really anticipate how you would blind a replication laboratory. Somebody who was going to replicate a study, I don't know how you could blind them to the actual study. But the concept of blinding within an experiment is a critical component of being able to replicate. Mm -hmm. that's, not, so that's something we haven't really talked about either. Is if you're doing an intervention study and you're testing, again, I'll use drug A as the intervention, and you know which animals are getting drug A, your bias, your implicit bias in the experimental design is that you're likely to see an effect if you want to see an effect. So how do you blind yourself to that drug? Well, there are procedures to blind. But the reality is, is that many people don't blind themselves. And there are examples of interventions where it's difficult to blind yourselves to the intervention. I'll give you an example, again, from the spinal cord injury field. Somebody treated spinal injured rats with a drug that caused them to turn blue, tinted their skin and their, their, their corneas blue. So it was very easy to see the animals that were treated versus the animals that were not treated. So how do you, how do you go into that experiment expecting to be blind to the potential neuroprotective effects of a drug when you can tell which animal's got the drug. So that, that is a, a, an important issue across all biological sciences. So it, I, yeah. Just very briefly, I mean, it, so this is not about the high risk per se, but I think in the, I, I don't do medical research, but if I did medical research, I think that there are some really interesting uh, ethical questions when it comes to, okay, 
if you think that a treatment might be beneficial, does that now make it unethical to have them get any other kind of treatment? Um, also, though, if you don't know if something is helpful because you never did the experiment, right, is it ethical to never do that work mm -hmm. because you're afraid that you might put some people at risk? I don't know. I mean, you know, there are things that you probably could do experiments on that you just hear, oh, we followed 10,000 more people. Now red wine is, is fine for, you know, is good for heart health. Oh, next week, no, it's not. Well, do the experiment, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, if you think there are certain active ingredients, you can do that experiment. You don't have to forever be throwing out correlational studies that cost millions of dollars and tell you nothing. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I, I mean, you know, so do the experiment. <laughs> but, you know, it, it seems to, if they're not doing the experiment because we might be assigning people to a condition that might not be helpful to them, that just doesn't seem ethically justified for, for things where you can do that. That's not the same thing as really putting people at risk. Um, but it seems like there are domains where that rationale gets used, but it doesn't really hold water. You would love this John Oliver bit. He goes <laughs> in on, the, on yeah. some of those studies. It's really entertaining, yeah. informative. So I'll close with one final question um, for Chris Chartier. Um, since you mentioned it in your presentation and it's been in the news, um, so could you tell us a little bit about the DARPA project to use AI to address the problem of replication? Um, yeah, OK. So DARPA <laughs> wants to be able to systematically predict the reproducibility of social behavioral sciences. So um, DARPA charged in, classic DARPA move, they're going to throw millions of dollars at this problem, and they want answers yesterday. Um, so the team I'm on, the, the way this project's going to work is that we're going to pull 30,000 published claims in the social and behavioral sciences um, from 11 subdomains, including psychology, but also economics, political science, demography, um, education. And from those, we're going to find 3,000 that have an identifiable scientific claim with an inferential statistic attached to it. So many articles are just going to get bounced from the filtering early because we can't find the claim. Uh, we, we don't know what the claim is. Or there's multiple claims, and that's perfectly fine and healthy. Um, of those 3,000, we'll then identify those that we can feasibly conduct either reproductions or replication studies on. We'll do probably about 600 of those. Um, and then other teams will create algorithms, expert judgments, prediction markets, or other human or technologically based prediction uh, metrics to evaluate the success or failure of those um, replication attempts. So the idea is we want to start to actually figure out what can you scrape from an article or have a, a human expert look at an article and really predict reproducibility. So DARPA wants to like solve all these problems. Um, they're probably being overly ambitious and they want us to conduct a bunch of studies way too fast. So we're <laughs> going to do our best. Um, but yeah, the project's called SCORE. So we're going to try to create systematized metrics to make these predictions. So if you want to get involved in that, we need more collaborators to conduct these and we should have some results in about three years. Um, and it should be about six times the size of the reproducibility project psychology, and it will be across fields. Um, so should be exciting. I hope they're happy with us. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of intimidating. DARPA is a, a yeah serious business. Be angry. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would be happy to talk with folks afterwards about that one because it's one where we're really welcoming uh, participation across the sciences. Great. Thank you everyone for joining, and come back next month. <laughs>